Good to see everybody here today, and great to be here. Uh, we are going to continue our study in Luke chapter 22. So Luke chapter 22, and we are looking at the Last Supper. Uh, we got into that a little bit last week and looked at some of the, uh, the things that were going on. We kind of tried to look at kind of the, the timeline of all the things that were going on there, putting together Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John's gospel. And I wanted to touch on a couple of things that I referred to last week uh, as we move forward. Um, one of the things we looked at last week was the idea of the, the cup. And, and in Luke's account, in verse 17 through 20, uh, some people look at this as perhaps somewhat um, uh, conflicting, and, and we kind of wonder what's going on. But when we look at the Jewish Passover, it makes more sense. So let's take a look at verses 17 through 20, where Luke writes, After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you, for I tell you I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with me, with mine, on the table. The Son of Man will go as has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. Um, here we see in Luke's account, he takes the cup and says, divide it, gives thanks, divides the cup, and then he takes the bread, gives thanks, divide it, and then he takes the cup again after supper and, and says this new covenant. So what's going on? And, and we kind of alluded to this last week, and so I wanted to just expand on it briefly, because uh, some people say, what's going on? Because Mark and Matthew both have the bread and then the cup. Luke has this cup, bread, cup. Um, and John, of course, doesn't tell us either one of those. But as we alluded to last week, when the Jews partook of the, the Passover feast, they actually had four separate cups that they would partake of. And if you turn to Exodus chapter 6, verse 6 and 7, I want to show you where they derived this from. We don't know the precise timing of when they started doing this, but this appears to be where they get the four cups and what they represent. In Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 and 7 in particular, this is what I found from my study here. Exodus chapter 6, verse 6. Therefore, say to the Israelites, now this is God speaking to Moses. Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I, I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm, and with mighty acts of judgment, I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. And I'll bring you to the land I swore with an uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. So as I read through that, I held up four fingers. I don't know if you were able to see that or not. Um, but each of those things, there were four things in there that God says he was going to do. And so they had a cup for each one of those. So the first one there in verse six was, I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. So this was a cup of sanctification. He was going to bring them out from under the burden of the Egyptian. That was the first cup, okay? Then they would have the cup of deliverance where it says, um, I will free you from being slaves to them. Okay, so that was the second cup. Then the third cup was the cup of redemption where it says, um, let's see. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. And the fourth one then was, is called a cup of praise where he says, I will take you as my own people and I will be your God. So they used these four statements there to rep and had four cups. So they had the cup of sanctification, cup of deliverance, cup of redemption, and the cup of praise. Now I did find reference in a couple places. They actually, some places actually had a fifth cup, a cup of wrath. Um, but these four cups, so one of those first two cups is undoubtedly the first cup that Luke is recording when he took the cup and said and he divided it um, among them. He said, I'm not going to drink this again. Probably the first cup. I'm not going to do this again until after the kingdom comes. Jimmy, you had a question or comment? Or... Yeah, I suppose that's possible. But as I understand the Jewish history at the time, they actually did have these four cups that they would use at Passover. Yeah. And so it's very possible that that first cup then was was the first cup was probably that cup of sanctification where he said you know i'm not going to drink this again until it comes into the um 
uh, until I come into my kingdom. Um, and then they would have the, it's either, I've, heard, I've seen both, either the third or fourth cup is the one that the second cup that Luke refers to. And this is the cup where he says, this is the new covenant, my blood. Because uh, the third cup re represented the cup of redemption. And you remember what Christ is doing is he is going to redeem us from our sins. And that's what he's instituting right here, the new covenant, I'll redeem them from sin. I am going to be this Passover lamb, uh, take away your sins. Um, and it also could be the fourth one where he says, I'm going to take you as my people. Because as Jeremiah um, talks about this new covenant, um, these, they will be my people. And so I've seen both either the third or fourth cup uh, is what's being represented here in that second reference in Luke. Okay, Debbie? Right. Yeah. Yeah, like I say, I think in Luke here, Debbie was saying that first cup, whatever it represented, was not representing his blood. Yeah. Okay. Because um, it's the second cup that he refers to, or the second one referred to here by Luke, and it was probably either the third or the fourth cup that um, the Jews would have partook at the Passover supper, okay? Um, and so they would be familiar with these cups, and Jesus is now kind of re, I don't know if repurposing is the right term, but he's now instituting this new covenant, um, which shows up in Jeremiah chapter 31, uh, verses 30, I think it's 31, 31. Okay, yeah, Jeremiah 31, 31 and following. So the time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I'll put my law in their minds. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother saying, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and I'll remember their sins no more. Um, so, I mean, it was clearly prophesied that there's going to be this new covenant uh, and it would be different than the old covenant. And at this time, Jesus is basically instituting or saying that new covenant is, is upon us. Um, this, this breaking of the bread, this blood, it represents my body, my blood given for the new covenant. Um, and under the old covenant, you remember, the Jews, they were born into the covenant. And so they had to be brought up and be taught about the law and who God was. In the new covenant, we learn about who God is. We learn about Jesus before we enter into the covenant relationship with him. So there's that, that difference there, okay? So, so, I mean, I'm trying to think about this in terms of the disciples and what's going through their mind at the supper, because there's a lot going on as we read last week. And so they're probably trying to process and take in a lot of stuff right now. And Jesus is trying to make this reference. I'm not going to drink it again until it comes to my kingdom. This bread represents my body and this cup is the new covenant. I mean, there's, there's a lot going on um, in here. But it, it's clear that they are remembering these things because um, Luke has taken time to go back and, and record all this. So these are things that are being shared. They're important things that had to, that people needed to know. Okay. And and obviously this was something that that we still do, and they were doing after this time was remembering what he had done at this time, partaking the body and the you know the bread and the cup, the unleavened bread um, and the cup as well. Um, it's also, I was also in my study, I was finding this, that um, when he takes the bread and breaks it, uh, what would normally be done at the Jewish Passover, would, the head of the meal would say, this is the bread of affliction, which our fathers ate in the land of Egypt. Let everyone who hungers come and eat. Let everyone who is needy come and eat the Passover meal. Everything eaten at the Passover meal had symbolic meaning, meaning the bitter herbs recalled the bitterness of slavery. The salt water remembered the tears shed under Egypt's oppression. The main course of the meal, the lamb, freshly sacrificed for that particular household, did not symbolize anything connected to the agonies of Egypt. It was the sin-bearing sacrifice that allowed the judgment of God to pass over the household that believed. So all these things they were they're partaking of, they had symbolic you know, reference and stuff to Egypt, but the Passover lamb didn't. It was something looking forward. It was that, that thing that was taking away the sin. God was passing over all their sins. And now Christ is coming as the Passover lamb himself to take away our sins. Um, so it's quite, quite meaningful uh, to these Jews in the, what's going on there. 
because uh, that, that Passover really represented the beginning of them as a nation, where they really had that, that start as a new nation. And here Jesus is saying, now I've got this new covenant starting uh, because of what I'm going to be doing that very night or that next day. Okay. So it's very, very important to them. Okay. And as we read last week, um, you know, during this time, there's, there's some question, there's a couple of things about the, the order of events that are going on here. And we can look at some of these a little bit, and I'm not going to try and be dogmatic about any of them because there are some discrepancies, and I don't think any of them change the, the tone or character of what's going on, the important aspects. But two or three things that, that people, you know, wonder about in all this is, one, was Judas present when he did this? Or did Judas leave prior to him giving these, these new commands? Because in Luke's occasion here, um, in verse 20 and 21, and 22, 23, it says, in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The son of man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. They began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. So here it would seem that Luke is kind of giving the account that they broke the bread and they had the cup. And then Jesus says, hmm, but the hand of one who's going to betray me is on the table with mine. He's there with me. Okay. In John's account, in John chapter 13, we see, and we don't see, and see, this is part of it. We don't see when they actually broke the bread and took the cup in John's account. So this is where it can be confusing. Um, in John's account, um, Jesus has gotten up. He's washed their feet and so forth, and um, he's predicted his betrayal. Um, starting in verse 18, I'm not referring to all of you. I know those who I've chosen, but this is to fulfill the scripture. He who shares my bread is lifted up his heel against me. I'm telling you now before it happens. So when it does happen, you'll believe that I am he. I tell you the truth. Whoever accepts anyone who sent, I send accepts me. Whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. After he said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified. I tell you the truth. One of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which of them he meant. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to the disciple and said, ask him which one he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it is the one to whom I give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the, bread in the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, son of Simon. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. What you're about to do, do quickly, Jesus told him. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had charged the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what he was needed for the feast or to give something to the poor. As soon as Jesus had taken the bread, he went out and it was night. So we have these details, but we don't know if this is during the supper or after the supper. Yeah, th this is another aspect of the Lord's Supper that's confusing between John's gospel. Tana was pointing out in John chapter 13, verse 2, um, uh, mine, the NIV reads, the evening meal was being served. And in Tana, which version are you reading from? What does it say? Uh, yes. Yeah. So in John 13, 2, in the New King James Version, a couple other versions, it'll say uh, the meal had been ended uh, when this happened. Okay. Um, and, and this is another place that there's some, uh, you know, people have had some discrepancy or wondered about if the Bible was really consistent and so forth. Uh, in, in my going through and looking at that and looking at other people who looked at it, it looks like the best translation, it was during the meal. The meal was being served. It wasn't after the meal. Yeah. Um, but again, it's, it's not entirely clear um, from these passages when Judas left during that meal. And again, that's why I say there's a lot going on during this meal. You know, we, we focus in, and rightly so, on the, the bread and the cup. You know, but you have another question? I mean, if you read through John's account here in 13, it would, it would indicate that Judas was there because of the fact in the order of events. Um, in verse 2, it says, the, the evening meal was being served in the NIV, and the devil had already prompted Judas to scare it some time to betray him. Jesus knew the Father put all things under his power, and he had come from God returning. So he gets up and washed the disciples' feet. The, in, and then we just read the other passage starting in verse 18. The implication is that Judas is there when Jesus is washing the disciples' feet. And then as Jesus is finishing that, he says, somebody's going to betray me. He was troubled in spirit. 
goes on to talk about it. And then he dips his bread, gives it to Judas and tells Judas what you're about to do, do quickly. And he gets up and leaves. And, and during this whole thing, I mean, there's a lot going on. And so at what point does he actually break the, you know, bread, give thanks for it and say, this is my body, give it, do this in remembrance of me. And this, this is the new covenant in my blood. Um, you know, when that actually takes place in all this account is tricky to try and put it together. Um, I read last week, I put the washing the disciples feet um, before that. And I put the stuff we're gonna read in Luke chapter 22 about who's the greatest after that. But I've seen accounts where that's been reversed. Um, it, it's because the way John did it, it's hard to, you know, reconcile precisely the order of events. Jimmy and then um, Bill. Yeah, so Jimmy points out, I mean, it, it doesn't matter really the order of events. It shows the, the heart of Jesus, the compassion of Jesus, that he treated all of them the same. You know, from beginning to end, he was treating them all the same with the same love and compassion that he's, you know, he's, he's knows that his end is near. and He's trying to sh share the things that are important before he goes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, this, yeah, we, we looked at this a couple of weeks ago, this account of uh, Satan entering Jesus. And we, you're right, and we see other places that, you know, spirits have entered people, you know, uh, demonic spirits that were common in Jesus day. Um, but here we see it about Satan. And, and we look at this, and I think the best explanation is that, that Satan was able to prompt Judas to the point that he gave in to the sin. I don't know that Satan actually possessed him necessarily, but that Satan was able to easily persuade Judas that this is what you need to do, and he did it. Yeah. Um, although, you know, and there's other people who say, yeah, he actually did physically enter him, but uh, it seems that Judas was still able to know what he was doing. You know, he had some control. Yeah, well, so. this is probably not gonna yeah, he, yeah he, doesn't, he doesn't want this to get messed up. He, he wants, you know, uh, he wants to get rid of Jesus. He's been trying to, uh, trying to tempt Jesus into sin, which we can refer to later as well. Um, but yeah, he's, I mean, Satan's undoubtedly throughout history has been trying to thwart God's plan, but he doesn't fully understand God's plan. Um, so in effect, he's actually carrying out God's plan. He just doesn't know it. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Right. It, re it refers back. Yeah. So Tana was referring to John 13, 18, um, where he says, he who stares my, uh, um, his lift up his heel against me. Yeah. So it's referring back to some prophecy, um, referring back to, um, Judas has that choice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is one aspect um, of what's going on during this meal, okay? But Jesus throughout, as Jimmy alluded to, throughout this, Jesus is, you know, showing his disciples who he is, what's coming, and what's transpiring, the importance of this entire meal, uh, this new covenant. And John, I mean, John records a whole bunch more that's going on during this meal, you know, chapters 14, 15, 16, and 17 with a prayer. Uh, there's a lot more going on than just simply sitting down for five minutes and breaking the bread and, and the cup. Uh, there's a lot going on there, okay? Uh, oops, okay. So, uh, so we've got Judas uh, there, and, and clearly he, uh, you know, he knows what he's doing. Uh, he's, as we just read there in John, he's getting up, he's gonna leave the table uh, to go to betray Jesus. And so during that time, I suspect that's when most of John 14, 15, 16 is going on. Judas is going over to confer with the um, the Jews, the chief priests, and so forth to betray Jesus. Um, and then the meal is continuing, um, and there's things going on. And the next thing we, we see um, is in verse 24, going back to Luke 22, verses 24 down through you know, about uh, 30. Um, this is an account that only shows up in Luke's account. We don't have these verses recorded in any of the other Gospels, okay? It says, also a dispute arose among them as to which of them was considered to be greatest. Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. Um, I want to just stop for just a second there. Verse 24, this dispute arose among which is going to be the greatest. And you can... I mean, you just imagine they've got this feast, Jesus is going to be the last feast, all these things going on, there's, they're arguing about who's going to be the greatest. This isn't the first time they've done that, right? Uh, do you remember the account where uh, the mother of, 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 of John and James came and says, hey, I want, you to, I want one to be on your right hand and one on your left when you come into the kingdom? 
you know, so there was an occasion there and the other disciples got upset about that. Um, there's also, I think it's in Luke chapter eight. I remember, right, I was looking at this last night. Um, another account as well. Oh, okay. Oh, it's Matthew 18, not Luke 18. Okay, Matthew 18. Okay, there we go. Get the right book, that helps. The trusting my memory, I gotta write it down. All right, in Matthew chapter 18, um, Matthew 18 and 20, we'll see this as well. Matthew 18, 1, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? You know, so, you know, they might be thinking, oh, I wonder if I'm the greatest one because I get to be here with Jesus and so forth. And he calls up a child and says, unless you, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Uh, so here's one occasion. And then just turning over a couple of chapters uh, in Matthew chapter 20, verse 20 to 26, this is where we see that request of the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons kneeling down asking a favor. What do you want? He asked. She said, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. I don't know what you're, you don't know what you're asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? We can, he answered. Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup but to sit at my right or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to, to those for whom they have been prepared by my father. When the 10 heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. And Jesus called them together and said, you know the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So here we see directly, you know, those two sons or the mothers asked for the sons to have a place of honor. The other people are upset. The other disciples are upset. And Jesus said, you know, it's, it's um, not for my place to grant for the first, but then also said, whoever wants to be the greatest should be the servant. Um, so we see that language there. Mark chapter nine, verse 33, uh, we see similar language. Mark 33 and 34. Um, when they came to Capernaum, then they came to Capernaum. When he was in a, the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because in the way they had argued about who was the greatest. So here's another occasion. They're arguing about who's the greatest, right? And then in Luke chapter 9, verse 46, very similar passage, Luke 9, 46. where it says an argument started among the disciples as to which of them would be the greatest. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, took a little child and had him stand beside him and said, whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me. Whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. For he who is least among you all, he is the greatest. Okay. So we've got several accounts where they were arguing about this stuff. They were wondering about who is the greatest. And so we get here to Luke chapter 22 and they're having this Passover feast with Jesus, he's instituting the uh, new covenant and they're arguing about it again. And, and Jesus gives this account. And if you, if I read through it, you'll recognize some of the same language we already read in the other account. So it's not the first time he's had to make this point with them where he says, the kings of the Gentiles lorded over them and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you a kingdom just as my father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes. Okay, so here he, he comes back and says, you know, the gen and he used the same language in Matthew, where he said the Gentiles exercise authority, they lord it over you. Uh, they have authority given by the government and they basically exercise, I'm the king, I'm the ruler, you do what I say or else, right? Um, and Jesus says it's not to be like that, okay? It should be instead, the greatest be like the youngest. The youngest was treated with, had the least authority, right, in the, in the Jewish system. The older you got, um, the elders had the most authority, most respect, the youngest have the least. And, but he says, you ought to be like the youngest um, and be like the one 
uh, the one who rules like the one who serves. And let's see, I think the wording is in here. Um, I was trying to think of Jesus used the wording that he was like one who served among them. Um, yeah. Verse 20, yeah, but I am among you as one who serves. And, and this is where we can come back to the washing of the feet, because I can, I can picture it both ways. On the one hand, I can picture as the meal is beginning, they're getting all set up, I can picture Jesus washing their feet. He's taking on that role of a servant, taking off his clothes, wrapping a towel, going around and being that servant, washing their feet, as you know, some, they should have done. And then they have this discussion, you know, they're arguing about who's the greatest, and Jesus reminding them, I'm among you as one to serve. You know, you think I'm the greatest teacher, but here I am. I've been, I'm serving you and I'm showing it tonight, right? But I can also see it the other way where they've had this argument and then Jesus goes and demonstrates it by washing their feet. So, Jimmy? Yeah, so Jimmy's referring to verses 29 and 30 about the kingdom that Jesus refers to here. And we'll get into that in just a second, um, okay? Because uh, I just wanted to finish this point about, you know, Jesus being a servant here that throughout this meal, whether Jesus washed their feet and they have the discussion or they have a discussion and Jesus washed their feet, Jesus is demonstrating what it is to be a servant. And, and he goes on in John chapter 13 and talking about, you know, that I give you a new commandment, love as I have loved you. Uh, he's over and over demonstrated his love, giving up his life for us. And that's what we need to, you know, remember. And I think that's one of the reasons that Luke has this in here is to remind us of the importance that we are servants, okay? Yeah. Yeah, uh, Dan refers to the fact that Peter and Paul, that they write about the same kind of attitude, and, and most notably in Philippians chapter 2, uh, verses 5 through 11 in particular, 5 through 7 in particular, where it says, your attitude, speaking to Christians, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient to death, even death on a cross. I mean, that's what Jesus is getting ready to do right here in Luke 22, is he's going to be obedient to the Father, uh, take on death. But he's over and over throughout his ministry, he has shown himself to be a servant. And even here at the Last Supper, he's continuing to do that. And, and Luke is recording this, I think, here for us to remind us that, you know, none of us is greatest in the kingdom of, God, king, kingdom of God unless we're servant. We ought to be a great servant. Um, and Paul, in a lot of his writings, talks about he's an apostle, but he also writes that he's a servant. He's a slave of God. You know, and that's what all of us are, that we are God's servants, God's slave, not that God's our slave to do our bidding. We're here to do his bidding. Um, and so I think, you know, Luke is recording this for us, and Jesus has been demonstrating this for us uh, to remind us that we're to be a servant. Uh, first and foremost, okay. Okay. Um, let's see. If, let's make sure I didn't. Yeah. Yeah. So I have my notes here. Um, living as a servant really is the best way to live. We are no longer concerned for our own honor and credit. We don't walk around. This is important too. We don't walk around with hurt feelings and disappointed expectations because all we want to do is to serve. We can always do what we want to do because we can always serve somehow. I thought that was a great statement um, because so many people get their feelings hurt and stuff and, and get bent out of shape and we don't do what they want to do or do it the way that they want and so forth. Um, but if all we're looking to do is serve other people, they can't take that away from us. You know, we can always go out and serve. Um, so no matter what, and, and I think that was the, what Jesus did. He was serving even the, the people who were gonna kill him. He still was trying to serve and minister to them. Yeah, so. Uh, it's an important, um, important point. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, and another little, uh, quote, and this actually falls on Philippians 2, 5 from Spurgeon. King of kings is a title full of majesty, but servant of servants is the name which our Lord preferred when he was here below. You know, but that's what he was. Okay. All right. So then we can get into verses 29 or 28 and uh, 29, 30 that Jimmy was alerting to here. Uh, says, you are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you a kingdom just as my father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay, 
So the reference here, I mean, we know that Jesus has been, from the beginning of his ministry, he's been saying the kingdom of God is near, the kingdom of God is coming. And as we read through the scriptures, we see that that kingdom is ushered in on the day of Pentecost, the church uh, is, is born that day. So the kingdom is here, uh, it's coming. And it's the, and the disciples, as Jimmy kind of alluded to, the disciples are the one who are proclaiming this new kingdom, right? Uh, so they've been conferred this kingdom. You know, God has basically given Christ the authority. Christ has given the apostles authority to go out and to proclaim the kingdom, to proclaim the gospel. And so they're setting up, establishing that kingdom um, in the hearts of men. So I think this is the reference to what he's talking about with this kingdom coming, okay? Um, because he, he, and he says, you will eat and drink at, my, at the table in my kingdom, right? You'll be part of my new, my kingdom that's coming. And then he says, um, and to sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And I think this may be kind of a, a, a reference back to Matthew chapter 16, where Peter makes that confession uh, about who the Christ is. Let's see, get back there and find the... Okay, Matthew chapter 16. And verses 16 and following, uh, Peter, Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And he warned his disciples not telling anyone that he was the Christ. Mm -hmm. So here Jesus makes a statement that, um, you know, based on this confession, the fact that you said, I am the Christ, I'm going to build my church. It's mm -hmm. built on that rock that Christ is, Jesus is the Christ. That's what the church is built on. The gates of Haiti cannot overcome it. You know, Satan can't overcome this. And then he also goes on to say, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And it's the idea that he's giving them the authority to proclaim God's commands. And that's what we see written in the rest of the New Testament. Peter and Paul, Jan, uh, James and John, whoever, they're giving the commands of God. They're, they're binding the things of God, right? And they're loosening the things of God um, in the scriptures they read. So they're given that authority. And in that aspect, they're given a, that idea of being able to judge, that they're showing God's judgment. They are not the judges but they're able to proclaim God's judgment, okay? Um, we, there's a couple of places in, in Revelation, I didn't write them all down, where it talks about the um, uh, 12 tribes and the 12 apostles. Actually, I think it talks about the 12 apostles being the 12 foundations of this new Jerusalem. I think that's, it's in Rome, um, Revelation 21, I think it's about verse 14, I remember right where he's describing this new Jerusalem. Um, yeah, so in the new Jerusalem being described in Revelation chapter 21, verse 13, there were three gates in the east, three in the north, three in the south, three in the west. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names, the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So we have this kind of reference that they were the kind of this foundation of this new Jerusalem. Um, that they're the ones, just like we read there in Matthew, and we're seeing here that God is giving them the authority to institute the new church, to, to proclaim God's commands, proclaim the gospel. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, just a couple minutes left. Um, any questions or thoughts on that? Okay. So I, you, again, you can see that there's a lot going on uh, during this entire um, Lord's Supper that he's um, instituting. Um, and we're going to come next week, we'll come back and we'll look at um, uh, Peter and his temptation, um, and then as they uh, prepare to go out um, to the Mount of Olives. So um, I think we'll, we'll stop, well, I'll read there um, verses 31 and 32, or well, 31 through about 38, and then we will uh, close with prayer. So the next thing that Jesus says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you've turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. Then Jesus asked them, when I, 
when I sent you without purse, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? Nothing, they answered. He said to them, but now if you have a purse, take it, and also a bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. It is written, he who was numbered with the transgressor, he, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment. The disciple said, see, Lord, here are two swords. That's enough, he replied. Okay, so this is what we'll take up uh, next week as they're getting ready to head out. Okay, right. let's go to Heavenly Father with prayer, shall we? Our Lord and Father, once again, we come to you, giving you the thanks for all that you have shown us. And Father, we don't maybe know all the details of everything that went on that night, but we know that there were many things that were going through uh, the mind of Jesus as he's tried to share with the disciples what's important. May, Father, we uh, hold on to those things that are important, the memory of you and what you have done through your son Jesus and dying on the cross for our sins and the uh, sacrifice that he made there on our behalf. And also the example that he was of a servant. May we be your servants this day and each and every day until we can spend eternity with you, praising you forever. We recognize that you are the one that has been able to redeem us from our sins and brought us into your kingdom of light. And may we be a light to those around us and sharing your love to those who don't know you. May your name be glorified. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you, everyone.